Hello and welcome to the London Satellite of the Understanding Risk Global Forum 2022. I'm Georgina Godwin and I'll be your host for this very stimulating day here at the Design Museum. And it's a very appropriate venue for this event. It prompts us to think about how risk is factored into design. And that's something that we're going to invite you to consider later on today. As part of the larger Understanding Risk Global Forum, we'll be joined by a large online audience, and both those in the room, that's you, and uh, on the internet will have opportunities to ask questions during the day. There'll also be some interactive elements, and so for that reason, and so that you can tweet, if people do still tweet, I'm not sure any longer, um, but uh, we're asking you to keep your phone on, but do put it on silent now, if you would. Uh, the hashtag is you are 22, and you could specify that this is the London Satellite Hub. Uh, you can also use the location-specific hashtag, you are 22LDN. Uh, in the case of fire or any other emergencies, there are fully trained fire marshals here, uh, and they'll guide you to the exits and the meeting point. We don't anticipate anything like that happening. Uh, morning break, uh, lunch and afternoon break will be served in the Hooth Gallery, that's upstairs on level two. Now, we are running a very tight schedule, so we'll need you to get up and down very efficiently with the help of our event staff uh, in order to return to the auditorium in time for the next session. So you should sort of think of me as a bit like a kind of head prefect or maybe a sheepdog or something. Um, so I'll be handing out detentions or perhaps the odd nip if you don't keep to time. Uh, the London Satellite Hub has been organised by Lloyd's Register Foundation in partnership with the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Centre and Anticipation Hub. But we're also very grateful for the support of a number of other partners, including Sense About Science, the Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk and the British Red Cross. So, to open the day, we're delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, who is Richard Blewett, Executive Director of International British Red Cross. Richard has, devo has devoted three decades to international humanitarian and development work across the United Nations and various NGOs. He'll share some of his experience in understanding compound risk, his time spent in Somalia, and some solutions the Red Cross have devised to help people deal with risk. Richard. Great, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start, you know, I, I rejoined the Red Cross three years ago um, because of my fear and concern about the climate crisis and the relevance of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement to doing something practical um, uh, and influential on that agenda. Um, so I want to start by sort of addressing the question of what does risk mean to me and resilience. So my first major professional exposure to risk was with uh, the Ethiopian government and Save the Children uh, through the lens of a program called the Nutrition Surveillance Program. It ran from 1986 to 2002, 17 years. At that time, there was major trust issues with the Ethiopian government uh, for many uh, countries in, in the West. Um, and there needed to be evidence-based data to inform decision-makings around response. So Save the Children partnered the Ethiopian government to essentially weigh and measure children all over Ethiopia and provide that data, and it worked. It enabled some level of effective response to the different crises Ethiopia had over those 17 years. Eventually, it was closed down because it was too expensive, uh, or thought to be too expensive, and it wasn't fully embedded in the Ethiopian government. And, you know, yet risk remains in Ethiopia. It's a different risk, but actually we're facing a major food crisis at the moment in Ethiopia, partly linked to the conflict in Tigray and partly linked to just endemic food insecurity in the country and, and levels of poverty and the climate crisis. So, of course, I'm a cyclist. I cycled to, uh, here today from the Essex Road up in Islington. Um, and there's a risk in cycling in London, isn't there? I don't know how many people cycle in London. Okay, but there's my fellow cyclists. You know, I used to cycle 20 years ago, and the risk was worse. Uh, there's definitely more places to cycle a bit safer. And, of course, as I've got older, I, you know, I've just chosen a very bright helmet to give me some level of security. I didn't have that in my 20s. Um, so, you know, risk is a personal thing, and I think we all experience risk, although I've, I'm a humanitarian and development professional, in COVID. 
in those moments when we all feared what was going on in all of our countries around the world, we lived with risk personally. And I think that we should think about that in the context of professionally how we, how we view risk. So I've seen lots of changing stories around risk, and the first one I'm going to start with is, is Somalia and Somaliland. So in September, I visited Somaliland. I'd last been there in 1994, which is quite a long time ago. Many elements of risk were very different, but some of them were enduring. So what was different? Well, in 1994, Somaliland had experienced conflict. There was a very weak state. There was somewhat a, a predatory private sector. Um, and then you come forward to 2022, you know, this year. There's peace in Somaliland, which is in the north of Somalia. There is a state functioning, although it's not internationally recognized. There's a private sector that works very well. And there's quite strong urbanization. But at the same time, there is increased vulnerability for agro-pastoralists who live in Somaliland. As a result of four years of drought, they're as vulnerable as they were back in 1994, but the factors that are creating vulnerability for them are changing. What about some of the similarities in Somaliland? Well, there's remittances. Remittances are a remarkable uh, part of survival uh, in Somalia. There's the clan structures. The clan structures, you look after your clan. Um, those have been very resilient over the last 25 years. The humanitarian system is there, helping. You know, there are great limits to it, and sometimes it's late, but it is there. And the other thing that hasn't changed is the lifestyle of the agro-pastoralists themselves, the people who look after cattle and, and, and sheep and, and, and camels. It kind of has remained quite consistent, even though the risks they face have got more difficult. So I just wanted to share a personal example. Stepping back and looking at the global picture, um, we have a growing humanitarian landscape. You know, there are compounding risks associated with climate, conflict, COVID, and cost of living. Overall, governments and citizens seem to have much less time to actually factor in and do recovery. How can we cope in living in an era of compounding risk? I personally find this very complicated and challenging. I think your expertise here, I'm sure, and discussions today will help you know, navigate continuous improvement in that agenda. On the humanitarian agenda and humanitarian response, over the last 10 years, we've seen a 400% increase in the funding for humanitarian work. So there's a lot of money flowing, but we still can't cope. We haven't got enough money in Yemen. We haven't got enough money in the Horn of Africa food crisis. We haven't got enough money in Central African Republic. And so huge gaps are still there. So clearly the humanitarian enterprise is not really the answer. Uh, we need much more systemic answers. You know, COP27, you know, in Egypt is another good step forward. Uh, particularly with regard to the establishment of the damage and loss provision. But of course, it's a contested agenda. Will money really flow? Who will get the money? How will it flow? Uh, many issues that are going to have to be addressed. And then, of course, sadly, on, on COP27, not enough is being done on mitigation. So we can only foresee uh, a worsening of the humanitarian landscape and the effects on climate in years to come. As I look through at the world through a risk lens, I want to highlight 12 areas where I think we're making progress, and you may disagree or agree. The first is anticipation and early response. This ends up saving lives and money. You know, we were not good at that as humanitarians. We were tended to be responding, but actually development actors and humanitarian actors have got into anticipation and early action in a better way. The second is uh, safety nets and ensuring safety nets and agile social protection schemes linked uh, can actually save lives and save money. The third area where I think there's an increase um, over the last 20, 30 years is high-performing early warning schemes linked to community action. If those work well, they save lives. If they don't work well, unfortunately, they don't. The fourth area that I would highlight that's obviously very critical, uh, where there's some progress, uh, but challenge as well is the question of national political will. You know, as it's absolutely critical to make sure that mitigation, risk mitigation plans and processes are properly in play and multi-stakeholder ownership. The fifth area I'd highlight is localization. You know, a lot of our humanitarian system is driven from the north, driven from the west, driven by self-interest. 
And actually, national actors need to solve these problems in their own political economies, governments and civic action, private sector. So localization is a positive trend in our sector and in the aid sector. Listening and partnering communities is another area where I think we're getting a bit better. But if we don't do that, we end up doing the wrong prescriptions with the wrong programming that doesn't create durable and sustainable results. I think we're making progress on data and models of risk, which are obviously critical to addressing better uh, the risk factors that are faced at the, uh, in communities and in countries. I think humanitarians are starting to be a bit more risk conscious. They're kind of being made aware of what risk means um, and how to sort of factor risk into our, into our processes. There's been, on number nine, there's been some work, more work around urban risk. Historically, our sector was very rural focused and actually urban risk is a huge factor uh, that we've got to think about much more agilely and, and be engaged with. Number 10, I think there's much more work on public and private sector uh, partnerships around risk, which is a really positive uh, step forward. There's a deepening, number 11, of understanding of linking climate, humanitarian, and development interfaces. We all work in our own little bubbles, but actually we've got to work together if we're going to find proper answers uh, to these challenges, including in the area of really investing in adaptation. You know, still far, far too little money reaches, of the inadequate amount of money put into adaptation reaches at-risk communities um, living in, in difficult circumstances. Twelve, I think we've made big progress on resilience. Understanding resilience, owning the term, it's got a lot of different meanings for a lot of different people. Uh, some people say it takes the politics out of risk, but at the same time, I think building resilience is going to be critical in the next 10, 20 years, and how we view uh, uh, humanitarian work, development work uh, going forwards. And then informed by all of that are the sustainable development goals. It is amazing that, you know, four or five, six years ago, governments around the world with civic action came up with the sustainable development goals. They're the best thing we've got to try and save our planet and help inform better policy making in the countries where we work. Um, but I think COVID, the, the conflict in Ukraine is, is, is knocking us off target. And we're going to have to go back to the SDGs because there's not much better on the table to find consensus about working together and addressing crises. But where are we struggling? Well, I'd highlight four areas where we struggle, at least from my perspective, uh, in this arena. The first is on fragile countries, from Niger to Central African Republic to Yemen to Syria. You know, the risk models and our tools to get on the front foot are just insufficient. We just don't have the ways to deal with these problems. And we can't leave 25 fragile countries behind because the com you know, all of those, that fragility is terrible for the people who suffer it, but it's also going to have consequences for the rest of the world in terms of security and safety and other issues. We have to get better, secondly, at factoring in risk and risk concern networks. You know, they're definitely getting stronger you know, um, in the way we're operating, but actually on the ground we're not scaling initiatives to solve the problem. So the scale of initiatives on the ground is insufficient. Lots of pilots, lots of energy from some governments like the Germans, but not enough scale to really get on top of the issue. The third area that I think we struggle with is joined up government. You know, multidisciplinary, multi-sector approaches. You know, it's easy to say it and roll it off the tongue, but actually ministries work in silos, agencies work in silos. It's not easy to actually get joined up policy making that's risk informed in reality. And then lastly, you know, I would highlight the issue of the trust in institutions is another factor that affects the risk landscape. Um, you know, in 2008, I went, I was asked by the UK government to go to, to Myanmar and I led the, the assessment for Cyclone Nargis. 120,000 people had died in Cyclone Nargis because the, the government in Myanmar uh, didn't issue any early warning system. Now, they hadn't had a cyclone for 100 years. So a combination of no cyclones plus a government that anyhow didn't have a close link to the communities that it was there to supposedly uh, govern over, you know, led to the crisis happening. But what I witnessed in the assessment was that it was possible to tell the story. The local civic actors you know, joined the UN, 
ASEAN, the government of Myanmar itself, to tell the story of what the problem was in the Delta and what we needed to do to provide durable solutions. But at the same time, each agency has its own answer to what the solutions are. So the World Food Programme will say it's food. UNICEF will say it's children. And so we still have a problem in our sector around a principle-based analysis of a problem that tells the story from the perspective of the communities we're there to serve. So anyhow, on the back of Cyclone Nargis, I helped set up an institution that's based in Geneva called ACAPS, which does independent assessment of humanitarian crises because we almost can't trust ourselves, which is not really a very good statement of our sector, because we come with our prescribed answers that don't really find results. Okay, so I want to now turn to, what about some good risk-informed work that's going on at the global level? And there's lots of it. I mean, that's, you all know that, you're all part of it. You know, I was very proud in New York in 2019 at the Climate Summit to help launch uh, the Risk-Informed Early Action Partnership, the REAP. I would urge you to look it up and have a look at what they do. It's a network of humanitarian, development, climate and environmental agencies looking at risk. And the idea is how do you make a billion people better safe from crises by 2025? It's an ambitious idea. Governments are part of it, civic uh, society, academics and others. Another initiative, obviously, that's been quite long-term is the World Bank's Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery that continues to do very good work. At the COP27, um, we, there was a launch of the Global Shield against climate risk. It'd be very interesting to understand how that's going to work, but it presents another opportunity. Ensure Resilience Global Partnership has going, been going a number of years, supported out of Germany. There's the Adaptation Action Coalition, the Anticipation Hub, which is part of our Red Cross family. Um, there's the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Risk Reduction. And the list goes on and on. And I'm sure many of you have other institutions that you're connecting to. That's a great ecosystem to be part of. I feel despite the momentum and the good news, however, the challenge is still to bring this to the ground at scale, where national ownership and political will are absolutely essential. Obviously, data is really critical to help bring things to the ground and make sure that uh, we are doing things in a way that's going to provide durable, sustainable solutions. And I think the World Risk Report uh, poll is critical for risk practitioners. This is a very exciting day here today in London. Um, I think it's a chance for a deep dive into how the climate crisis is changing the risk landscape. Uh, and also how systems thinkings on economics can help us tackle systemic risk. You know, you've got a fantastic speakers this afternoon coming to talk about those questions, because we're going to have to think differently. Our models are not sufficient and they're not working if we're going to get on top of the challenges we face. So I would urge you all today to meet at least 10 colleagues here, maybe 15. Um, have fun, uh, innovate build collaborations, and continue to do the work you really do well, which is uh, deepening work on risk in years to come. Um, I've already met three, and I'm very happy to have done so. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that you will definitely outperform me today uh, as you get to network with each other to sort of find ways of building something to move forward. So thank you very much. Many thanks to Richard. Now, it's time for our first session, Risk Know-How in Communities Around the World. Moderating this session is Tracy Brown. Tracy's been the director of Sense and Science, a uh, Sense About Science, I beg your pardon, since 2002. She's received many public honors in 2010. The Times named her one of the 10 most influential figures in science policy in Britain. She's been recognized by the Science Council for her work on evidence-based policy making. She's been made an OBE for services to science and an honorary professor at UCL in the Department of Science, Technology and Engineering in Public Policy. Tracy, over to you. Thank you very much. Georgina, thank you. Uh, and uh, I've, actually, I invite my panel to come up and, and sit at the front. Uh, let me grab it. So, Sense About Science works with communities to make sense of and ask questions about information. Um, we promote the public interest in sound science and evidence. 
So what, we, what does that mean? It means we equip people with good questions, uh, things which they need to know in order to make decisions, and that includes politicians and journalists as well as communities. We also equip the research community to answer them in human language, and we work with both of them and with decision makers to create an environment that's conducive to decisions that benefit people. Now, one of the th challenges some years ago that we came up against was that there was a lot of complaining about communities and about the public not understanding. And in fact, those continue to this day. You saw the UN actually just two months ago was, um, was critical of the fact that people didn't understand, didn't realise they needed to take action on climate. And people don't understand risk. You hear that all the time. When you see a newspaper article that runs a story and some people believe it and they shouldn't or they get a hype story and people don't understand risk. But what was it that they didn't understand was something that we set ourselves. And we started to look into that, working with the foundation and with many others. I'm, I'm causing you some feedback. Um, and with many other organisations that we've worked with at the, at the community level uh, to produce the risk know-how framework. And this is something that draws from experts all over the world who have um, been working on a risk communication for some time, as well as drawing from the people, parents making decisions about their children undergoing surgery, for example, people trying to work with farmers uh, to decide whether or not to grow drought-resistant crops uh, based on the, the uh, climate forecast um, and risk the, the yield, working with people who are um, uh, trying to you know, tell farmers not to not to uh, take in their crops because there's been an oil spill and it's going to poison people, and so on. So we're drawing from the kinds of experiences at the coalface. We've created a risk know-how framework. But this framework goes through in some detail what are all the things we need to know. Technically, how do we understand something that's a single incident versus uh, repeat incidents, and so on. But what it also does is it puts that knowledge in uh, with, with two other things, which is your capacity to make a decision, to do something about the risk you face, uh, which will be influenced by very many different things, and also the trade-offs that you're making with other risks in your life. What might happen as a result of this? What if you do this? What don't you do? And so on. And that's something, putting those three things together, all very, very important, is something that the risk know-how framework does. So we did that, and some of you may remember that we launched that together um, and... Um, I'm just going to jump over this. That's all the numerator, denominator bits that do people, people do need to know. Um, and then what we began to find is, in talking to people about this and some of the material that was coming from the World Risk Poll as well, we found that people um, had a lot to share from those community experiences that was not being synthesised in any way and reflected back at the very agencies um, uh, who are giving out that risk information, whether it is safety in the workplace or first aid or um, you know, uh, fishing safety and so on. So it was not being reflected back. And we found that they felt they had a lot in common. So we shared uh, amongst them, uh, uh, themselves, we shared some of their stories and experiences and have been developing the framework since. Well, what today marks is the opportunity to start really synthesising more of those experiences and actually asking what are people finding helpful. We're very excited to be working on producing a platform that will be responsive and encourage other agencies to be responsive to what people need. They often find themselves in that situation where they're, <clears throat> you know, they're suddenly in a, a, a risk practitioner. You know, there's an incinerator being installed in a community. People don't know is it safe or not. And somebody gets kind of elected the person to go and find the information that community needs. Uh, and so they f suddenly find themselves wanting to be able to take what they're finding and communicate it with a group of people. There are others who spend their whole lives, uh, including my speakers today, uh, actually doing that professionally too. There's so much to be learned and we're embarking on that. What do people want and need uh, today? And I'm delighted to have a fantastic uh, panel to do that. We have Adam Parnell, who is a professional marrier, a mariner, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> he may be a professional marrier. We just don't have that in the <laughs> in the brief, um, but and and works for a confidential human factors incident reporting program, 
We have Catherine Hill, uh, who is the Community Resilience Coordinator for the British Red Cross, so some very different bases of experience. And finally, Leonard Lee, who will be familiar to many of you, um, who is Professor of Marketing at the National University of Singapore and specialises in how emotional and cognitive factors influence our decisions, uh, but is also the direct Deputy Director of the Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk. Uh, and he will be reflecting on some of those experiences too. But I'm delighted to ask Adam, would you like to share your experiences with us first? Fabulous. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can all hear me using one of these FBI mic things. Um, oh, okay. So my name's Adam Pinell, as you've heard. Um, I have been, uh, I'm, a, I'm a military veteran. I spent most of my life either on or in the water. Uh, and most recently, uh, I've been harbour master of several harbours and now I'm working for CHIRP. I've been there for 15 months. Uh, CHIRP is a UK-based charity. It's a very short title for a long acronym. It's a short acronym for a long title, as you heard. Uh, Confidential Human Factors Incident Reporting Programme. Um, and the reason I think I've been invited here to talk to you about understanding risk is that I think actually, um, inadvertently, I guess, or by lucky happenstance, we, I think, probably extol and use a lot of the uh, risk know-how framework um, intuitively and when we were became aware of it we just thought this is a great thing to to actually you know incorporate much more deeply into what we do um, I'm going to put that up there if you forget and if you if you remember nothing else I think that's a really good uh, uh, thing you know learn from the mistakes of others you heard Richard talk about silos uh, and you you know I, I think if we were to look at what understanding risk means um, you know risk if you take it backwards, risk is a human, primarily a human endeavour. Yes, there is a risk to the environment and to wildlife and infrastructure, but, but primarily in this context, we're talking about the risk to people. Um, how many of you would be shocked, or how many people here know that you know, uh, recent, recent research has indicated that 100,000, you heard about 120,000 people dying in a tsunami. On average, that many fishers, fishermen, fisherwomen, die every single year if, if the latest research is correct. Um, it goes under the radar, nobody knows about it. Um, we talk about risk, uh, and, and, and intuitively people want risk uh, to, to, to be mitigated. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, comes down to having an understanding of what that risk is. Uh, and so what we do, uh, I'm gonna put this up there just as a bit of a background while I talk for a moment. Um, just in case anybody here wants to find out more information. So what we offer is a voluntary, independent, impartial, no blame, no finger pointing, uh, uh, reporting, instant reporting program for people who want to come to us when they feel that they can't use uh, any other reporting system that may or may not be available to them. Um, we in the Maritime program have been running for just under 20 years. My aviation colleagues have been running for 40, getting on 41. We offer this worldwide in multiple languages to anybody that works in, on, or around the sea, whether that be a ferry passenger, whether that be a merchant seaman, whether that be a recreational sailor, whether that be a stevedore helping unload or load cargo in a port, uh, or whether that just mean is a member of the public walking by and thinking, I don't think that's right. Uh, why do we do that? Because actually what we're trying to do is provide, uh, or our, our unofficial byline is, we are the voice of the mariner. We are there to speak up and advocate on his or her behalf when they feel that they can't. Why, and that, and that is, I think, when it comes to understanding risk, we've got to understand the challenges as to why we can't identify uh, these things. And quite often, people are fearful of reprisals, fearful of their job, fearful of uh, you know, being, being made unemployed or not being paid if they speak up and advocate for their own safety. Unfortunately, uh, and I don't think it's too uh, contentious to say that quite often organisations put profit over people uh, and therefore, you know, they, they are not interested in having that safety and these risks pointed out to them because it's not in their commercial interest. Uh, and we have uh, a body of people who don't speak up because they are fearful that if they speak up they will look stupid or that they will uh, somehow be, be ridiculed. What do we do with that information that we get? Uh, the reports that we get, we analyse in, uh, and we look at the underlying human factors. What do I mean by that? Um, a really simple example, um, if a fisherman falls into the water not wearing a life jacket and drowns, 
uh, lesson identified would be wear your life jacket. We don't look at the lessons identified, we look at the human factors. What stops that person wearing a life jacket? Was it available? Were they trained? Um, was, there a, was there a local safety culture? You know, we do find in some organisations a very, very toxic culture. I had somebody tell me that uh, they didn't have an incident, they only had a near miss because it was an Icelandic fisherman because he, he lost three fingers on his non-writing hand. But that was a near miss because it wasn't the whole hand and it wasn't his writing hand, so it wasn't really... You know, so we're fighting against cultures all the time. Um, and really, I think that's all I wanted uh, to put up about that bit. Um, but if anybody is interested in what we do, uh, we offer that reporting service. And I think uh, the biggest challenge that we have isn't so much finding the learning, it's actually disseminating the message out to the audiences. Um, because right as we speak, there are about 1.4 million people at sea, um, about 150 languages spoken. We translate our uh, safety message into seven, and it surely will be eight, of the most populous languages that is spoken out in the world, uh, 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 seafaring communities. Um, but actually trying to get the message out to people is really difficult. And that's why very recently we launched our app, so we can actually be putting that message directly into his and her pocket uh, while they're out at sea. Uh, and that is something we've never managed to achieve before. I hope that's uh, provided you with a little bit of an insight as to why I'm here, what we do, and what risk means to me. Thank you, Adam. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine. Catherine, can I ask you to come up? While you do, I'm going to take your seat, because I think we're confusing the sound engineer up there oh, by changing okay. seats. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I'm just going to talk about our British Red Cross's Community Resilience Programme. So what is community resilience? Um, by community resilience, we mean communities who can identify, prepare for, or reduce the impact or cope and recover from shocks and stresses without compromising their long-term prospects. So today, I'm going to cover a little bit about our program, um, the British Red Cross's approach to risk communication, learnings from our project and initiatives in the community, and support um, and tools that we use. So when do we need resilience? Our program identified that we need it to face uh, the climate crisis and increase of um, the, lack, sorry, the lack of emergency planning leadership and community involvement and underprepared, underprepared communities. So what can we do about it? We believe that communities can be more resilient by harnessing community skills, local assets and talents and by having their voices heard. The program has three overarching goals engagement, awareness, and cooperation. So when the British Red Cross goes into communities, we first listen to the community's needs uh, and take into account factors such as social, cultural, risk perceptions, and local knowledge. This ensures that we can share appropriate information as well as involve the local people we work with, giving them the opportunity to actively participate and guide our emergency programs and operations in a person-centered way. So here's what we've learned. Community, communities have a varying uh, perceptions of risk. These perceptions could influence the decision about how to address risk um, and take preventative steps. Uh, we will look at the following topics with this. So risk perceptions of emergencies, a look at heat waves in the UK, uh, emergency concerns and scenario exercise workshops, and trusted voices. So last year, the British Red Cross researched the public's perception of heat waves. The review of evidence found that while the UK heat waves have a severe impact on people's health and well-being, most people in the UK do not consider themselves at risk from heat impacts. Worryingly, this includes, includes high-risk groups. So through policy initiatives, we are advocating for heat waves to be better communicated and for more measures to be put in place to protect people. Um, so how are we tackling people's perceptions of heat waves in a positive way? We collab collaborate in workshops to communicate risks, boost awareness and engagement surrounding hazards. We collaborated with the University College London and Red Cross Climate Centre on a research project to develop early warning systems on heat waves using art-led methods to engage people. We walked around the community and mapped cool spaces and even created a music video about the need to get ready for heat waves. The more people understand the severe impacts of heat waves can have on their health and well-being and the assets available to them, the more prepared they will be to act when a heat wave does come along. So discussing 
uh, and educating people at risk is not always straightforward. Social cultural factors such as education, language, beliefs, values and demographics all influence people's perceptions of risk. In the UK, every borough and council has a risk register and emergency plan. When we spoke with different communities, we learned that only 13% of people had an understanding of their local emergency plan. And almost all the people we spoke with believed that it was a government's sole job to protect people from hazards. To help communities understand their risks and develop solutions, we ran emergency concern exercises um, and scenario exercises. Both activities gave people the opportunity to communicate their concerns, learn about and explore different types of hazards and emergencies, as well as develop actions and solutions. To communicate about risks and resources, we must build trust and relationships in the local area. Our solution to this challenge was working with existing trusted voices to help us communicate the information and resources. We recruited volunteers from the community who knew their community best and were keen to lean our engagement uh, in initiatives. Um, we learned through our work that um, there, there, there's a lack of empowerment that many communities face. Communities need spaces, structures, tools, uh, knowledge, as well as partnerships to communicate and advocate for, advocate for positive change um, and to meet unmet needs. So in this, we'll cover community empowerment, partnerships, capacity, and capabilities. Building community empowerment means the community, community's voices are heard. To do this, we ran various workshops and sessions that brought to get together different stakeholders with different levels of power. For example, in one borough, a community experienced a devastating fire and wanted more pl um, say in the pl emergency planning process. So with, together with the community, we worked with the council emergency planning team, housing developers, and the fire brigade to bing, begin co-creating an emergency uh, fire preparedness plan. When communicating risks, um, it's important to consider factors such as capacity and capabilities, as well as a need for diverse partnerships. A good example of this was our COVID vaccine hesitancy session and the training of community resilience, community advocate, uh, community vaccine volunteers. In both examples, we partnered with local authorities, health bodies, as well as community organizations and leaders. Each brought local knowledge and contacts, knew the locally um, spoken languages, and possessed a wide range of skills and capacities that together helped us rapidly engage with vulnerable communities who face barriers to vaccine access. We also trained the volunteers on how to hold affected conversations with people about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and vaccinations. So here's some, I'll just go over some tools and support that we've used. So starting with co-production um, co participatory approaches, some of the British Red Cross resources, our training packages for volunteers, and some digital assets. Um, so the enhanced vulnerability and capacity assessment um, tool is a participatory risk assessment process to support communities to assess and analyze the risks they face and to come up with solutions to reduce those risks. So most of our workshops use this tool. Next, we also co-produced and developed resources, resources such as the fire safety and heat wave checklists. And the British Red Cross also has developed an app that educates people about common emergencies. Um, next, we, we co-produced training for volunteers in the community. The training helped them build confidence and develop as leaders to assess community need, needs, map assets, and use digital tools for community engagement, data collection, and analysis. And finally, through our scenario exercises and our work with communities, we've started to build more resources sources such as digital content and an asset database which would allow for better communicating and sharing the community's unmet needs and the assets available to help them prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. Thank you. Whoops. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Leonard. Need to come away from you. Okay. Well, yeah. So, uh, for those of you who are actually not familiar with this uh, institute, uh, so essentially we are a multidisciplinary institute uh, that attempts to use uh, different uh, social scientists in order to understand different aspects of this. And it is
is actually our goal uh, to be able to uh, look at different types of risk, uh, have a better understanding of risk perception, you know, so as to help to uh, support uh, evidence-based uh, policy making uh, to bridge the gaps between uh, public and experts uh, in risk perception. Right? So, so we uh, focus on three main areas. So we looked at uh, data and uh, uh, technology risk. Uh, we looked at health and uh, lifestyle risk. Probably project. <laughs> and uh, we also looked at uh, climate and environment risk. Is this working? Yes, Paul. Hello. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, so we are a very small team. And uh, so today, uh, this morning, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I would like to share some of the reflections uh, that we have uh, from some of the work that we have been doing at the Institute. And so uh, I really have only three main points. Uh, so. Uh, please allow me to run through these points very quickly. So the first point uh, that I have is that uh, it is really critical uh, to understand uh, your audience, right? So, uh, so I cannot agree uh, 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 more with uh, what Richard said, that risk is something that is very personal. So as a consequence, we really need to understand what their needs are, what their values are, what their beliefs are, right? And uh, so... Uh, so last year, uh, we actually did a comprehensive study uh, with uh, undergraduate students at five different universities uh, in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. And uh, some of the results uh, from this study uh, are actually quite interesting. And uh, so, so here's a slide uh, from, a study, uh, from the study that we conducted. So we can see that on the left side, right? So these are how the uh, students from these five different countries rated a series of uh, uh, personal level risk. So we can see that uh, re regardless of where the students came from, uh, so th there is actually quite a lot of similarity, right? So the students are primarily concerned about uh, not having enough money, you know, they are not, uh, they are worried about not getting a good job after graduating, they are uh, worried about, you know, mental health challenges, uh, severe impeding uh, uh, illnesses and so on. Uh, but what is interesting is that when you get to the right side of the uh, 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 the slide, you see that uh, at a society, uh, a societal level, you, you, you see much more diversity, right, in terms of what people consider as risk, right? So, uh, whereas like certain issues like rising living costs and fake news, you know, they are, they're pretty much like shared uh, 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 by, uh, these are risks that uh, people across the five different countries, you know, consider as important. There are certain issues that are actually flagged as much more important in certain countries than in others. You know, like for example, in Singapore, uh, so Singaporeans are very concerned about aging, uh, but at the same time, you can see that something like terrorism is actually uh, much more uh, uh, on the minds of uh, the, the Indonesian uh, uh, students, right? In our research, we also found that it is important to think about, you know, uh, who are what we call the risk targets, right? So are you thinking about this risk to, your, to yourself, or are you thinking about this risk at a more global, national level, right? So we found that when people think about risk uh, as a, from a personal level, they tend to be driven much more by things like worry and fear, you know, their emotions. But when they think about risk at a much global level, they will think about uh, drivers like, um, you know, like uh, perceived controllability, you know, to what extent uh, can this risk be controllable? They might be concerned about the, the magnitude of the perceived impact of the risk. Right, so we can see the people think the way that people think about risk really differs, uh, even for the same type of risk, right? But depending on, you know, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, who, uh, who is this risk? Uh, what is actually the risk target, right? So this is a risk for the person, or for the uh, for the friends, or for the the, the society at large, right? Uh, but we don't just uh, 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 live in isolation, right? So we very much are influenced by the people around us. Right? So uh, as much as risk is a personal issue, we also looked at the behavior and the actions of others and what others tell us. Right? So, uh, so it's important for us to remind ourselves, uh, we believe that uh, people don't l just look at others for information, but they're also influenced by others for all sorts of psychological reasons. For example, they might uh, want to uh, enjoy certain rewards, avoid certain punishments, you know, uh, uh, you know so when, it, when, when they see someone do something, uh, right, and, um, and they enjoy, you know, and, and someone gets certain rewards, they might want to follow the same 
behavior in order to enjoy the same rewards, right? And, uh, and vice versa, if they are trying to avoid certain punishments. Uh, but importantly, uh, following the behavior of others also allow people uh, to actually get a sense of belongingness, uh, right? Uh, 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 allows them to feel accepted, right? So there are lots of psychological reasons that might drive social influence, right? So the second point uh, that I'd like to highlight is this important, uh, what we will call the attitude behavior gap, right? So I think this is extremely crucial in helping us to shape and to carve the message uh, that we want to communicate to the community, right? Because sometimes, you know, people might have the right understanding of risk, but uh, why are they not acting on this understanding, right? So I think that's really critical, right? Uh, so for example, in some of the work that we have done uh, in the space of su sustainable uh, transportation, we found that people may know that, you know, uh, using personal vehicles, you know, contributes lots of like carbon emissions uh, uh, in the environment, but why are they not using public transport, for example, right? So uh, this slide uh, perhaps is not too surprising uh, to many of us. So there are lots of reasons, right? So people think about all these trade-offs, you know, when they are deciding to act on the information that they, uh, that they have or not. For example, they might think, is this an issue that is relevant to me? Or maybe this is more, you know, uh, to the society, right? Do I have to sacrifice my own self-interest, right, for uh, the, the good of, of the environment or for, for the rest of the people. So people might have a present bias, so they care about the now, and they worry less about the, the future, right? Uh, so, uh, so people might have a set a, a way of doing things, so they might be susceptible to what's called the status quo bias, that, you know, I've been driving all my life, so you want to ask me to start by like, using public transport right now? Am I going to do that? Right, so they might think that whatever that they're doing is only a drop in the bucket, so there is no perceived impact. And finally, a lot of these outcomes or, or consequences of risk uh, could actually be really abstract and uncertain, right? Okay, and finally, uh, the last point uh, actually pertains to a project that my colleagues and I are really excited about uh, right now, and we call that the project wavelength. So essentially, uh, it is also important to bear in mind that the way that the public think about risk could actually be very different from how the experts think about risk. And experts themselves, uh, practitioners, we are also human beings, so we are also susceptible to all sorts of biases as well, right? Uh, so, so in this project, uh, we try to conceptualize and assess risk perception and risk perception gaps, and our goal is to be able to identify where are the domains and where are the areas that we should be prioritizing, you know, where are the, are the, uh, the ge geographies that we should be focusing our work on, and we also uh, would like to set up like multi-stakeholder forums to really set the agenda uh, uh, for this work. Right. So uh, my last sentence is that uh, we actually have an exhibit uh, today uh, and, uh, and outside, so we call that the, the, the tree of risk. And I'd really like to invite everyone uh, to share your thoughts uh, with us regarding what you see as the risk of blind spots and the risk of hot spots. Right? So where are some of the areas that the public might underperceive risk and what are some of the other areas that the public might overperceive risk? Thank you so much. in a really short space of time, but there were clearly some common themes coming through. I would just like to take a bit of a poll of the room. Who, who feels optimistic in the context of big changes, big issues like climate, that we can have a better conversation about negotiating these risks than we're having now? Who feels that in the next five years we'll see improvements in that conversation? Okay. It's a, a fairly optimistic room, a fairly optimistic room. But I think there's, there's work to be done. And clearly, in the, in the you know, sort of things that you were talking about, Adam, you know, we're talking about human factors, and, and there was the word local is appearing and empowering people to actually define that. I, I'm, you know, you're asking that question, what stops a person doing something about it? Do we kind of need to denormalize some of the things that we accept, is what I'm asking. You know, is that, do, do we need to do a bit of work sometimes to say that's actually not reasonable and to, to let people see other communities where that's not okay and worrying that your main breadwinner's not going to come home tonight 
is something that people don't tolerate? You know, is that something we need to do more of, almost to problematise the risks we're living with? That's a really um, interesting approach, and I know that some safety messaging services do try to do that. Um, you know, they'll go into the community and talk to, uh, as you say, you know, the, the families of people, and actually say, you know, we, we and, it, and it's almost using that indirect pressure to drive local, to drive local uh, uh, cultural change, behavioural change, to, to improve safety outcomes. Um, I, I think. That, is, that, that does work, as you say, at the local level. I think sometimes, though, you almost get these sort of what I call group cultures. So you might get uh, a culture, I'm going to talk very maritime now, so do forgive me. You might get a culture on board an individual vessel, but then you might get a, a slightly nuanced and different culture um, when you go across that fleet, and then again when you go across that port. Um, you know, and all those people may be living in the same community. I mean, more and more they're not. Um, uh, on, a, on a vessel, on a vessel now, we're finding uh, that people don't interact with their fellow crew members mm -hmm. as much as they will. They will. They almost outsource their their. And we find the real issue of isolation on board um, because people aren't talking internally; they're talking externally. Why? Because of language, because of culture, um, because you know you've got if you've got a. a Right now, a, a Russian master with a Ukrainian sort of second mate and a, a, a Filipino crew, but there's probably got a couple of Indonesians and some Chinese, um, and they're all trying to use English uh, to, to varying degrees of success. Trying to get that internal cohesion is very difficult. Um, uh, but nonetheless, what then drives them to try to be cohesive is they try really, really hard to fit in, and so they try to become normalised. Uh, and of course, it's that internal pressure. And it's very hard to break that from a, from mm -hmm. remote. We, mm -hmm. But but you know, it does work in some circumstances, but not in others. Yeah, that's interesting because we're getting very similar kinds of comments about that from construction mm -hmm. as well. They're trying to create a common conversation um, in that environment. If you want to ask something, um, do throw up your hand because um, I'm very happy to take questions. Is there anything at the moment that people want to ask about what's been presented or the experiences that Catherine, Adam and Leonard have talked about? Yeah. There's a lot in that question to unpack, but just a, a very brief answer from you, Leather, and then, and then maybe we'll start unpacking that, because that goes to what Catherine was saying as well. No, thank you so much for the question. Uh, so it's certainly a question that, uh, we, that we, are, uh, we are really grappling with, and that it's why you know, we started the entire like, project with Lang. Right, a uh, project on uh, uh, risk perception gap. Okay, so just a very quick answer to your question. So in that survey, we did not uh, compare uh, the perceived risk with the actual risk, but in some cases, we do see a large uh, divergence. Right. So let me give you an example. Right. So for example, uh, there was a study that was conducted across uh, Singapore last year, and they found that people do know of the uh, the uh, the environmental risk that is associated with driving. Right. But they also found that you know, people are not switching uh, to public transport as much as we, we would like to for a variety of reasons like you know, convenience and uh, like perceived impact and so on. Right? Uh, I, I cannot agree with you more. I, I think uh, if you were to look at this from the other side, there are also certain possibilities where you know, people might over-perceive risk. Right? So which means that you know, that's going to lead to un unnecessary stress, anxiety, and so on. So people might be better, you know, uh, 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 you know, I mean, it's better for them to, uh, to, to divert their resources, mm -hmm. right, to mm -hmm. actually dealing with risks that, you know, they are, they are perceiving, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that goes some way down the track there. Yeah. 
Um, Catherine, one of the things that I've noticed is that if we think of risk communication at that one-to-one -one level, you know, like we're putting out a warning on, a, on an app or whatever, um, you're limited really because you're talking to per a person as an individual. Whereas work that I've done working with communities, for example, which is exactly on what Lena was just describing, talking about what transport options have we got in London to improve the environment um, and to you know, reduce emissions, transport being around a quarter of emissions. Um, you know, then already people start talking differently because they're in a community setting. And it seems to me that there is, there's more power in that setting to have a better conversation than you would if you were just seeing a rather flat kind of communication. Is that, is that your experience, that yeah. this is kind of building people's confidence in, yeah, in talking exactly. about risk? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we would, um, our emergency concerns workshops, you know, that was a, we opened up a kind of a space and a platform for people to openly um, and honestly discuss their concerns. And we were talking about emergency large-scale emergencies, that's what we were trying to communicate to them and get an understanding. But actually what we got out of it is most people were concerned about really their perceived risks. So, you know, um, knife crime, hate crime, um, are they going to have enough money and food to put on the table? Um, but through those discussions and conversations, we really, really um, uh, explained to them about the other risks that they may face. And, but also always taking into considera consideration their perceived risks um, and trying to work with them on how to kind of tackle both at the same time because those were their big worries, not so much a little bit the climate crisis and the bigger scale emergencies that might affect their health and well-being. But it was just really important to help them um, communicate um, their worries and then come up with solutions and actions which we we shared with local authorities, the emergency planning yeah. teams, mm -hmm. um, and the wider community. Fantastic, fantastic. Other questions here? Any other questions in the audience? Yeah, over there. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, microphone is, is coming your, your way. I think, I think we need to be sympathetic to the peop people who are online. <laughs> They're just wondering what we're talking about. <laughs> Hi there, thanks. Uh, my name is Felix. I work for a network of civil society organizations for disaster reduction, GNDR. Um, part of what this is, is quant quantifying qualitative data. You get people's understandings of risk from a local level and then putting them into a report. What are the challenges that go around that transition of turning information, normally at a sort of spoken uh, method, into something that you can quantify? Um, how easy is that? How difficult is it? And how do you, I guess you could say, how do you work around different perceptions of these words, risk, resilience, adaptation? They mean different things to different people around the world. What are the challenges and ways forward there? So can you just clarify your question for me a little bit? So you're thinking about when we're trying to draw from community level understanding of a risk and, and we're wondering whether or not we're you know, we're, we're taking one person's kind of comment and another person's comment and putting them together and assuming that they mean the same thing. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. I right. mean, taking two comments from two different communities or nations and weighing how relevant they are to each other in our own understandings. Right, okay. In front of you is sitting Sarah Cumbers, who runs the World Risk Poll, uh, wondering if I'm going to have to make the mic go. Sarah, it is worth saying something briefly at this point about, about that, isn't it? Because that's been done on a global scale with uh, awareness of some of those issues. It has, Tracy, thank you. So I'll be talking a bit more about the World Risk Poll in the second sh session this morning. We're releasing um, our third report from the 2021 poll. We commissioned Gallup, the global polling company, um, to ask a series of questions about risk and safety to people around the world. And one of the first things that we did in the 2019 poll was to ask that question, uh, what does risk mean to you? And we do find that people think differently about risk. Mm. Um, it can be opportunity, obviously, or it can be negative. Um, but then we look at the results of the poll knowing that. Um, and the other thing to say about the World Risk Poll is that when you ask uh, 125,000 people questions about risk and safety, as we did in, in 2021, um, you start to smooth over the bumps in, in terms of people's interpretation of what you're talking about, um, and, and you can be very confident in the responses that they give and in your understanding of what they're saying. 
Yeah, I think that's it, smoothing it out with the, with the bigger numbers, which is sometimes, there's always the risk, isn't there, that we overreact to what is, you know, taking, you know, on board what Catherine and what Leonard have said, that we overreact to something which is actually quite specific to a particular t place and time and community. Um, I've got a final question, because we, we, we've got a very short session this morning, which doesn't do justice to all the important themes that you've put on the, on the agenda, the three of you. But I do feel that the rest of today is going to draw heavily on, on these um, uh, points. But I've got a question, really, which is about learning from other people who are not like us. You know, we've emphasised local differences, and it's important to understand context and, and, and the capacity to act. But what about... You know, I'm struck by how people often draw from people in quite different situations to them and feel inspired to act. And thinking about things like the World Risk Poll that shows us a picture of maybe another country that has got a similar profile to us. You know, it's really clear that obviously if you're in the Philippines, you're not going to necessarily learn from North Atlantic fishing. Right, and, and the resources that are available to you are different. But there are other parts of the world where you have got a similar profile. You have got island nations and fishing states and so on. And so people are interested. And can we empower them in that way too, a bit more? Can we paint pictures of here is a similar, or here are others working in a similar way, um, and they have managed to do something about this. And I'm talking about this top to bottom because we can talk about those countries that say our city is too big, too heavy of traffic and you know we have so many goods to deliver, we can't possibly cut our emissions. And you kind of go, well, actually, yeah, but Singapore did <laughs> on this front. So, so can, we, can we cause some reflection like that? Is there, a, is there a market for this? Should we all be doing more of it? Is my final question to you. And I'll take, Leonard, I'll take you first and then Adam mm -hmm. and then okay. Catherine. So, uh, so I think that's, that's a great question. Uh, and I think uh, it also kind of highlights the importance of this entire risk know-how initiative, right? Uh, uh, so I, I, I mean, certainly I think there are lots of diversity and differences in terms of uh, the context, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, social economic, uh, social cultural environments and so on. But I think at the core of uh, uh, many things, you know, you also have the basic psychological uh, 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 drivers of risk. Right, uh, so there are certain kind of like basic uh, drivers and dimensions of risk mm. that will actually affect uh, people uh, very similarly, uh, despite uh, the the source of risk, despite the social uh, and uh, cultural environment. Right, so uh, to the extent that you know that driver is the same, you know perhaps there are lessons to be learned, uh, despite the uh, the difference of context, despite the difference in uh, the, uh, the the type of risk that you are talking about. But at the same time, it's really about you know, uh, uh, finding out what is the core and then uh, adapting it right? yeah. uh, in order to transfer the learning. Right, very helpful. Thank yeah. you. Adam? No, I, I couldn't agree I more. Think you, I, I think you're I, already I, might. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with both of you. Um, uh, certainly in, in, in our context, we learn quite a lot from our aviation colleagues because you know different transport modes. Um, and one of the great things about be looking at human factors, and this is why I think it's for us really powerful, is because we're looking at things like, you know, what is an underlying cause? It, it, it will be fatigue, it will be memory lapses, it will be sort of um, supervisory violations. You, they were told to do it even though they knew it was wrong. Um, and so actually these are things that happen in every walk of life. Um, you know, there will be people in any transport mode that will be to just get on and do it mm -hmm. because we've got to get there in time, uh, even though they know it's unsafe. You know, and and that, that, that happens at all scales uh, and, and in all types of uh, craft. And, and, so, and I know I appreciate I'm speaking very transport oriented, um, but I think, yeah, there is a lot that can be learned. We do quite a lot of work with different academic institutions who look precisely at this on a very abstract level because we recognise that the, the learning that they can present to us has a direct benefit in the field. And actually, in a way, we only use the reports we receive as a vehicle to put those messages onto mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, be, otherwise, it becomes very abstract. But, and, and lots of people like to learn from the mistakes of others because it then brings it to life. But no, you're right, actually. So, so I think the trick there is to do that really wide learning, but then contextualise it in a way that the recipient wants to hear it. Yeah, someone once said to me that learning from work, workplace safety from aviation was really important because in aviation, when it went wrong, you really saw that it had gone wrong. It goes very badly. You know, wrong. but yeah, the lesson yeah, is yeah. The, the, the lesson is um, applied elsewhere now, mm. and that's, that many of the things we know we know from that sector. So that's interesting. 
Catherine. Hi, everyone. So yeah, I agree um, with Adam and Richard and what they were saying. Um, so for us, in order to, we, we can share um, the work that we're doing in the communities, um, and we do that through uh, two online platforms where people can, or sorry, communities can upload basically their learnings, their assessments of their communities, so they can create community profiles, and they can also share um, the actions um, that they've taken to reduce risks. So on the EVCA website, there's a huge um, database of uh, reports that communities put together. So you can see, you know, even though there's different contexts and different cultures, you can find some of the similarities and really understand their approach to reducing risks, their risks. Um, and same thing with our community and engagement accountability um, uh, uh, tool. Um, we also have a website where we share all of this um, with all our national uh, society partners um, in 200 plus countries. So yeah, it's really important that that learning is accessible and open for all to, to use. Thank you. I really think we are at a moment in, in time and space where, where something is emerging here as a different way of thinking because we're all coming at this from very different backgrounds. We've, we're beginning to learn from each other um, and yet we're kind of drawing very similar conclusions and it seems that we've got a, a pragmatic and principled approach uh, emerging. Uh, around talking about risk and negotiating risk in our communities um, and how to bring from the, right from the academic uh, uh, setting right through to really at the coal face of decision making, how to bring those together. Uh, it feels very exciting for me and the, probably I've, I, the first time I felt like this really come together in an opening uh, plenary of a, of, of a conference. So really thank you very much indeed um, and I'm delighted uh, that we were able to come together this morning and look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks there to Tracy and of course to the panel, Leonard, Adam and Catherine. Don't forget Leonard's uh, risk tree uh, that you can contribute to. That's in the exhibition space. Uh, and that of course you can tweet this uh, using the hashtags uh, UR22 and UR22LDN. There's a break now, refreshments served in the Hooth Gallery, that's on the second floor. Uh, do come back here promptly, please, for 11.45. Uh, and when you do come back, we'd urge you, please, to just move forward if you can and just fill in the sort of available space from the front uh, going backwards. Uh, uh, so 11.45, enjoy your break. When you come back, we'll be talking about data and AI.